Hi everyone! Welcome, welcome! Exciting! Let's drop those emojis! Welcome, welcome, welcome! If you hear me, who do we have here? We got Danny from Pomona, California. Welcome! Montreal, welcome, Anna! Oh, Aloha from Jinky! Hello, hello! Let's see. Oh, I saw Tanishka here. Hello, welcome, welcome. Where is everyone from? Who is excited? Let's see how many people we got online. I see you guys all coming in all over the world. Amazing, amazing. Nita from the Bay. Hi, welcome. All right. <laughs> I see here Lakshmi, Tara. Oh, Dallas. Hello, welcome, welcome. Welcome. Okay. Welcome, Bill. All right. We are going to do our cloud threat modeling. And I have here your amazing coach, Joshua. I'll let him introduce himself. But let me see here. Isabel saying, hey, everyone. Good seeing you. This is Isabel from Alberta, California. So we have everybody all over the world. And if you guys don't know me, my name is Jaya. I am your programs manager here at Click. I deal with your community. I help your coaches bring these experiences on board for you all to explore the world of cybersecurity now data analytics and also ai so this is super exciting for our program so i hope that you and your friends and you bring them along because it is a very very exciting time so welcome 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 i'll go ahead introduce your click coach this is joshua hi joshua hello let's go and introduce yourself because everybody here especially for those who have not seen you yet. I actually want to know. Like, let's go ahead and survey who has who is new here to click. So, like, give me a heart emoji. And if you're new, the air meets. It's right there. The smiley face. Who's new here to click? Give me a heart. Amazing, amazing. Welcome, welcome to this community. This is like a really fun way to learn. A really fun way to grow. So we welcome you in extending. A wonderful welcome. And then I want to know who's been here with us. Now you're like kind of like, oh, who's this new coach? If you have been here with us, give me a uh, sunglasses sign. It's like the number four shortcut. If you're not new with us, sorry. Not new with us. All right, we got a couple of people here. All right, Joshua, time to introduce yourself to the rest of the team here at Click. Yeah, so I am Joshua Flashman. I'm currently a uh, security engineer over at Circadence. Uh, what we're going to be going through today is uh, cloud threat modeling, um, and that is essentially going through and uh, poking all the little holes in, uh, you know, you get a cloud design diagram of what the cloud architecture of a application will look like. So we're going to go through and walk through that cloud architecture uh, and explain, you know, step by step what that looks like and, and you know, maybe why uh, they chose the things they did. Uh, this is all hypothetical. So we're, we're going through chipper cash. Uh, I just kind of went through the website, made a hypothetical, uh, design diagram. Traditionally, the developers would actually provide this to you. Uh, and we're going to go through and try to poke some holes in the, in the potential one, uh, and feel free to chime in. Uh, I did not take note. Like I, I took notes on like a five or so, uh, that I know we can find. Um, just in case, but as we go through this, uh, I am hoping that we will come out with, you know, eight to 10 or possibly more, uh, that we think of during this session. So I want this to be as interactive as possible. Please feel free. I, uh, I don't know if, do they have the ability to, uh, chime in over voice or anything like that, or just over text? Yes. Yes. They'll definitely can, you can come up on stage and I'll go ahead and I'll introduce how they're, <laughs> how they're, how, what's it called? How we they get to come up on stage and then grant just said joshua are you secretly flash on your day off i might be that's uh that's secret. a great so question <laughs> <laughs> uh but yeah I, I would love to see as collaborative as possible please do not like traditionally this would be a, a bigger group meeting uh when i've done this in the past uh you know there would be the stakeholders from the the team that's presenting this there might be one or two other security engineers on the call poking holes where they can um and every person has their own interpretation. So all the ones that I, I created are from what I look for as from my experience of what I think are uh, concerns. But you know, you might have your complete 
completely different perspective on it, which doesn't need to come from a place of like fully understanding these technologies. Just just having a different perspective gives you a different opinion on where this stuff can go. Amazing. So you hear that everyone. So drop that all of your ideas into the chat, but not to worry if you are again are new here, you get to experience and see and take a look, take a look a little bit, right? If you're like, I actually want to know if you are, you can give me a thumbs up. Does anybody know about cloud modeling or like, because cloud modeling, I feel like is a little bit more broad of a topic and give me a thumbs up if you know about it. And if you don't know about it, give me like, a wow. If you don't know anything about cloud modeling, give me a wow. And if you know something, give me a, like a thumbs up. All right, so a lot of people that are new to cloud um, threat modeling, I see one or two in the, in the what's it called, that they know a little bit of something. So this is gonna be an exciting session for you all. All right, so quick agenda for everybody who's new here at Click. Again, I welcome you. We're gonna go over just general experience. What is a sh shadow session? What did you like? what's it called, sign up for. We'll look into what the experience is. Joshua already kind of gave like what, you know, what what cloud threat modeling is about, but we'll go ahead and dive a little bit deeper. And then after that, Joshua will show us his screen and then that your coach will walk through this scenario and then you can definitely ask questions all throughout. And then lastly, you'll have a QA and a and then just we'll reflect on what we've learned. And here are some core click principles. Remember number one is we all learn from each other and all of our experiences are new and they are innovated because of how you interact with us here. So again, the best way to interact is through asking those questions, drop them into the Q&A. And remember, this is not a lecture. So Joshua is not here, your coach isn't here to say, this is how you do cloud threat modeling. He'll explain what goes on, what is the scenario, and that's really how we learn. You get enough What's it called? We get enough lectures already from um, <laughs> from our courses, our classes from before, but this is like how we learn here at Click. Number two, this is a safe space for you to try. So again, no grades, no scores. We're not going to judge you. That's like an absolute low no. So you volunteer, try, con contribute. That's I think my 20, 24 word actually is to contribute because that's how we learn and how we grow together. Number three. We say it, we mean it, because we do love to have fun. It's an improv. Like I already love Grant. Grant is like already saying like if um, if we all have secret identities. <laughs> so again, drop a joke. We're here. I'm gonna try to figure out how to put cloud threat modeling into a dad joke. We will see by the end of this session. <laughs> all right. So what is the shadow session? This is an hour into the life of a security professional, which is your coach, Joshua. And it's almost like a day in the life and um, we're figuring out a specific skill together in this one hour session. It's really open for anybody who's trying to get into the cyber sec field. But remember what you learn here can also translate into other careers as well. So cloud threat modeling is also being used in IT sectors and also other, um, what's it called, like another tech role. So it's really nice if you get to learn this and mesh, mesh it together. I was reading through a couple of your introductions, how um, some of you are looking, were in data analysts, or some of you were like in Salesforce, and now you're looking into CyberSec. So really it's a blend of your, your skills, right? And there is a space for that. Um, so again, throughout the experience, if you have any questions, you can put them in the Q&A section. It should be on their right hand side. There's like a bubble there that says Q&A. And then you can also raise your hand. So there's a raise your hand feature here on AirMates and you're welcome to join the stage and ask your question live or give your feedbacks live. And we'll give you the mic when you get to share your screen, you have access to that, but also it's more like to interact with us too. So you're welcome to join the stage if you are ready for it. <laughs> All right, without further ado, Joshua, in like five minutes or less, what is cloud threat modeling? If you were to explain it to somebody who, like me, I'm not, like, I don't know anything about cloud threat modeling. Like, how would you explain that? Yeah, so I think we should take a step back actually and uh, talk about what a design diagram, that, that first part that, cause it seemed like, uh, you know, you should have that frame of reference of what a design diagram is to begin with. Um, specifically, when it comes to uh, cloud design diagrams, uh, you're going through and, you know, as a developer or whatever your role in this team might be, because uh, we also will commonly see, uh, 
you know, product managers or other people on the team taking this uh, step. But taking a look at the documentation, uh, taking a look at the code base and kind of piecing together what the cloud architecture of your application visually looks like. Uh, so like within, in, in this case, all the examples I'm going to use are from AWS because uh, it's the one I'm most familiar with. Uh, but this can be completely generalized. So you, you would do this exact same thing for Azure. You would do this exact same thing for GCP, although I've never used GCP, um, or any other of the, the, the major cloud uh, tools. Um, but you, you're essentially just drawing it out, and you're drawing the flow of what a user interaction with a cloud architecture uh, would look like. Um, could we move this? I'll keep explaining within my five minutes. Could we move the slide over to the, the sample just of the design diagram so they can see what I'm talking about? Yeah, so that that is just, a, the, that's the one we're going to be working on. I'm going to send a link in a bit and share my screen of an interactive one. Uh, but that is just a plain design diagram, no security stuff on it. Um, and you'll see it kind of walks through. And I'm going to take a, a few minutes and walk through it on the developer side, uh, how a developer might introduce their design diagram uh, before the security side. So. During a security review meeting, you will you would go through this uh, this document that's been created. It's been used for designing the actual architecture itself as they're actually building the... Uh, traditionally, you might use something like Terraform, which is a, uh, a type of code that you can use to build cloud models uh, and cloud applications. Uh, otherwise, you can, you know, if you really wanted to, you can build them in the UI itself. Uh, but either way, this is a good guide for what you're about to do. Um, and a threat model of that is, at least in the context that I've done it, uh, because they're uh, in the context that I've done it, is taking a look at this design diagram and kind of poking little holes in wherever there could be a concern. So, you know, if you see something that's exposed to the internet that shouldn't be exposed to the internet, uh, or that looks like it even could be exposed to the internet, uh, you just add a little note and say, hey, can we please make sure that this is not what it looks like or what it could look like and that it's not exposed to the internet? Sometimes. Uh, and a lot of times, the, the things that you're poking have already been resolved, and they've already been thought about, which is good. Uh, and honestly, that's kind of what you want to hear, because you you would go through this, make this threat model, and then meet back with the team to go through, OK, have you already done this? Yes, cool. We can get rid of that. Uh, have you not already done this? OK, let's make a ticket. Let's get a process going. And uh, over the next month or two or whatever timeline you guys want to agree on, uh, we'll try to resolve that issue. Uh, to make sure there's no issues going forward with that vulnerability. Um, all of this, again, is not like we're not doing any pen testing. We're not attacking their actual infrastructure because a lot of times this is done before anything's even built. Um, there might not be anything actually exposed. This is all just, you know, they might just put in their notes, hey, when we build this resource, here's a little star note at the bottom. Make sure that it does this. Note from security. Uh, and it's just little reminders like that. So uh, I think that's about as good. Oh, I'll, I'll just throw this into. Um, so there is, you know, I'll be honest, I didn't know this until after I had left this role. Um, so this is from a, a previous role that I mostly did this in. Uh, but there are very many ways, different ways to do threat modeling. Uh, if you Google threat modeling right now, it's not gonna look anything like I'm showing you right now. Um, this is exactly what I did when I was in the role and how we performed them at my previous company. Um, whatever company you go to might be completely different. Uh, there is like official guidelines and ways to do it according to OWASP and, uh, you know, different ways of doing it on different types of applications. Usually cloud threat modeling is just a small section of that. Uh, and at my previous role, we previously, we went through very heavily on, uh, what's it called? On the cloud side of threat modeling. So that's what this is going to focus on. Awesome. This Anybody have any questions for Joshua as you as you learned about? So Joshua, from what I understood, it's we have a diagram, which is a cloud diagram, and we are talking about a specific app. Um, like we're talking about a specific feature into the application and pretty much like product engineer or anybody like on that team, we send you the diagram and then you analyze where the potential holes are. And then you create those notes to make sure that we have the like so that like the product team or like the engineer team can kind of or de developer team like can pretty much mitigate and answer like okay like what is the solution for those holes does that make sense mm -hmm. like does that did i kind of capture that yeah that's pretty much it uh okay. sometimes Perfect. it might be more specific uh recommendations like you know 
make sure that this is spe like specifically we we can see uh, when going through, especially if the, the application is already created, we'll log we'll log on to AWS and look at it and see has this been resolved and answer that question ourselves. Uh, and if it's not, that instantly is a ticket. It's no longer just a does this exist already. It can be yeah, we know you're I mean, not doing this already. This is a ticket. It's going to be on our design diagram or threat model, but you know that 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 one's not getting removed unless you can really justify why it's there. Um, as a developer, awesome. uh, and I think I see one awesome. question already. Um, and I'll just yep, I see it right one. here. So, so, yeah, absolutely. So JC is asking. It's oh, sorry. I just like neither read it. Just in case oh, for anybody who's listening in, ahead. like, is threat modeling done simultaneously with app and software design? <laughs> there you go. Yeah, absolutely. It is. Uh, traditionally, you know, a lot of times you you get you'll get to a company, and uh, I will say I've only done one that was actually where it's supposed to be, which is before the application is created. Um, a lot of times mm. you're kind of stuck, uh, what's it called? You're kind of stuck in the, in the case where the, the application has already been created and you're going through a little bit of their code, a little bit of their, what already exists. Uh, but ideally you want to do this before the application is created. So ideally, you know, you would, the, the, the team would throw this together in the first few weeks of planning before they've even built anything or just started to build the bare bones. Mm. Uh, and that's when the security team can go through and give the recommendations. And that way they are more recommendations and not just, you know, oh, you, this is wrong, fix this. Uh, Cause then you start to get in the territory of like pen testing and uh, code analysis and stuff like that. When this really shouldn't be as much of a technical job. I see. And so Eliza has a follow-up question. It looks like cl cloud threat modeling is a part of a security advisor role, is it? Um, I think, you know, the terms within security are very loosely thrown around depending on the company. Um, you know, everyone that worked in security at, uh, actually every company I've worked at is a security engineer. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, I, it, it, there, there can be specifics to what you do. Uh, and I, you know, to be honest, that's the, my, my answer to that is it, it depends on the company you're working for. Uh, if you go to some companies, you might always be a security advisor. Uh, you know, in, in that role, when I was at, uh, when I was doing uh, these threat models, at the same time, I was also coding, uh, code scanning stuff, which is completely unrelated, uh, and other stuff that would more traditionally fall under security engineer. So it's it really whatever they can fit you into and whatever that team that you're getting on, uh, has taken over is what you're going to be working on. Um, you know, this specific task does not need to be technical. You do not need to know how to code. You, you, you should have an okay understanding, at least, of how cloud uh, uh, services interact. Uh, and I'll explain it for you as we walk through this. But, you know, uh, that's really the only technical experience that's needed. Uh, there's no cloud, uh, there's no code reading needed, none of that. Uh, it's just, you know, in other parts of the role, you might need to do something like that. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Joshua, for that. And then we're going to go ahead and thank everybody for all of your questions and then write them down as they go. But we're going to go ahead and get into the scenario and like so that we can already like just watch Joshua. Like, how do we, how do we even do this? OK, so we'll go ahead. Let's get started. So this is the scenario that we're going to try to fit this in. So your coach has been hired to come in as a security engineer working for Chipper Cash. So Chipper Cash is the company and it's a cash transfer app. It's concerned about compliance requirements, federal pri um, privacy laws, and like it's like some security like questions regarding their application. Much of their data is stored in the cloud and the company wants to be aware of any threat scenarios that they need to be aware of. All right, this is the cloud and I'm gonna go ahead and I'll give Joshua the the screen so he can start explaining, but I do have like my notebook. I'm like ready to take notes and I hope you are all ready too. <laughs> um, I'm gonna go ahead and share it two ways. So uh, I mentioned this before, uh, but we are going, I'm gonna go ahead and share this link to the Miro board. Um, I believe this should give you guys the ability to comment on it without interacting with it. So if you guys have some comments, Feel free to add them. It might, if it tries to make you make an account, there's no need to make an account or anything like that. Uh, feel free to just watch along. I'm also going to share my screen. Want to give everybody a heads up. Miro is a tool that a lot of us like in tech or dev use to either track things down. It's like really well, like if you want to explore more, if you're new to Miro, it's like a great app to 
to use and then we'll find you there we'll see your arrows <laughs> um but we'll also joshua will also share his screen <laughs> let's see might have to set this up real quick give me two seconds all good i see them popping in there <laughs> Oh, I may need to reopen Chrome to approve screen sharing. So I will join you back in two seconds. I apologize. <laughs> okay, no worries, no worries, no worries. And this is why like I prep for like like maybe background music. It's like dun 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 dun. All right, we'll stop there. I'm gonna wait for Joshua to <laughs> accept the screen sharing um policy like what's it called settings and then we'll go there but for now take a look at the cloud diagram i'll go ahead and i'll take over for a little bit so i can guide you all so this is what we should be seeing together so this is the cloud diagram this is miro and this is chipper cash cloud diagram so you can move it around we can also um what's it called see what the different like application stuff is so this is the, again like it's an aws like cloud system and we love miro i i like miro too i i'm a big figma fan but miro is also great so we can see it from here um i'll let joshua talk about it but this is what i'm seeing it's that there's like boxes there's icons i'm like letting you guys know what i think off the top of my head because again i am not a uh what's it called i'm not a techie person <laughs> Yes, no need to sign up. What? Let me see here. Uh, there you go. Hey, Joshua. Hey, sorry about that. Yeah, it wasn't letting me share my screen until I had uh, done that. Okay, no worries. Welcome back. Thank you. Let's see. There we go. Now it should work. Can you guys see okay? Yes, but they're asking um, if no need to sign up on Miro, the shared link wants me to sign up. Um, Let me send a view. So that one's the, the comment one. That might, I know the view only one shouldn't make you sign up. Let me, let me send you guys that one too. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Okay. Mm -hmm. But also you don't have to sign up because we'll be following along yeah, here. Yeah, I'm going to be showing it here. That's just if you want to, so, you know, that will give the ability to zoom in, look at something else that I'm not pointing out. Uh, I'm going to be sharing my screen and walking through it as I'm walking through it. Uh, and if you're awesome. watching it from the interactive thing, you should be able to still see my mouse move and everything, but then be able to interact it in your own way. Yay. Okay. All right. If it's if it's asking you guys to sign up, feel free to just watch it through the screen share. Um, I'll be honest, I didn't really test it from that end. I've just, you know, I thought it'd send out the link if you guys wanted to interact with it. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and walk through it anyway, so. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and start by uh, kind of playing it as the developer uh, and walking through what uh, Chipper Cache does uh, and the services that as a, as a developer uh, that they've created. Um, just FYI, this is not accurate. Uh, this is not like, I, I've never actually seen Chipper Cache's code base. I cannot confirm nor deny that they do any of this. I don't even know if they're on AWS. Uh, this is just a, a hypothetical of the a, a large overarching threat model in a, done in a very basic way. Uh, so we'll kind of walk through. So an end user would connect through the web browser uh, to the DNS record, which is uh, the HTTP address that uh, Chipper Cache has registered. In this case, they've kept it all nice in AWS and used, uh, I think it's called Route 53 is AWS's DNS register. Uh, and then from there, they'll go through a VPC internet gateway uh, to get into the web VPC. So this is a virtual private cloud. Uh, and that is, you know, just making sure there's no IPs that are in a bad range, uh, that are known threat actors, stuff like that. It is someone spamming the site, uh, can blacklist their IP, stuff like that. Um, and then from there, once we're in that virtual private cloud, uh, there is a network access control list, uh, that will allow them to get into the public subnet, but not into the private subnet. Because uh, there is no NACL on that, uh, and connect to the load balancer, which will send them into. Oh yeah, uh, which will send them into the private subnet to actually see the website. So in this case, uh, Chipper Cache is hosting their website uh, within an EC2 server. 
Uh, that's where their application UI is, uh, assuming this is a web app. Um, built something like JavaScript or something like that. Uh, and you know, it, the users can log in from here, interact with the application, send money, receive money, stuff like that. Uh, so I created four sample services of stuff you might do. Um, so I did a account creation service uh, with an S3 bucket containing, so just for reference, an S3 bucket is a simple storage solution by Amazon. Um, so it's their, uh, you know, bucket storage system. You just throw data in, uh, it, I wouldn't say auto formats it, but you know, it's, it's the easiest way of storing data, uh, without a lot of setup, without, uh, you know, consideration for long-term secure storage. Um, but very usable for stuff like a public profile. Um, and in this case, you know, you go on a Venmo or something like that. You see someone's public profile. It's a very similar concept. Um, we also have a send cash service, uh, which sends cash from one user to another. Um, that reaches into the account database, which is in a separate data VPC. Uh, and that's where it has the account record that has everything like the, the balances, um, whatever the users have stored in their account. So if that's, uh, I think in, yeah, in this case, we have crypto as well um, for Ch Chipper Cash. Uh, so, you know, their, their to private tokens would be stored in there, um, a record of their balances that connects to the blockchain and stuff like that. Uh, there is a authentic an authentication logon service that just verifies the, uh, the what's it called, the encryption keys uh, against the account database uh, and does that uh, encryption to do that verification. Um, and those are the services that are provided uh, within the application. Uh, outside of that, we have some things that are not, you know, directly part of the application. Uh, we have privileged users and non-privileged users. So privileged users is your developers, your security engineers, your cloud engineers, anyone who should have access to modify your Git repositories, your uh, make changes to the CI/CD process, um, and anything else that they might need to interact with manually. Um, you also have non-privileged internal users. Uh, so that's, you know, upper management, people that might not be technical. Uh, you know, if you're at a finance company, the finance side of the business that might need to use this application, uh, but doesn't necessarily, you know, if they need to see AWS billing uh, for whatever reason, especially if they're out in finance, for example, that they would need to see that AWS billing, but might not be the person to go to to make changes to the code base or technical in any way. Um, you know, they connect through a router within the company and ideally a VPN uh, and connect to the Git repository directly to CI CD service and directly to the container registry. Um, and uh, to, to give a very, very light explanation of what a container registry is, uh, you, you, if you have a virtual machine, uh, you can create a image of that machine uh, traditionally with a tool like Docker uh, and you upload it to a uh, register of containers, uh, where then when you have an application, for example, the website, uh, since that's conceptually running on an EC2 service, which is a virtual machine, it'll clone that, uh, you know, saved virtual machine and display that as the website. Uh, and that's where you're storing those virtual machines that are pre-built. Um, and then your CI CD service builds that from code from the Git repository. Uh, let's see. I believe that's it as far as what uh, this, you know, very overarching chipper cache service has. Uh, so again, each of these services would normally have their own separate design diagrams. You know, just the account creation service itself would have this whole huge design diagram. Um, just the send cache service would have its own huge design diagram. Um, in this case, we're just looking at the overarching big picture uh, which would also normally be its own design diagram. Um, any questions then before we start looking at this from a security side of point of view? I feel like everyone's brains are like, tut, 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 tut. like if I, if like, I wasn't as sure, as like... if there's something you want me to explain, I'm happy to explain any technical terms. I tried to be as uh, non-technical as possible, but there's some where I just kind of forget that it's not something that's discussed every day because um, you know I kind of live in my own little world right now. 
Uh, all good. All so good. I think I'm going to summarize it a bit. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to summarize this a bit. So remember the chipper cash is a, like a finance like application. So for all of us who are like new, right? So chipper cash is like finance application. There's specific functions here, like, you know, creating an account, sending a cash. So like kind of like our, our Zelle. Um, totally okay, Minda. Like I, I'm here. So we have like account creation. We have like a send a cash service because we're using chipper cash as far as like a user can send or receive money, right? They have like crypto service. And then we also have like authentication because that is a needed function, especially when we have like an app like Chipper Cash, right? So think of Chipper Cash as like your, not Zelle, like a, like as far like a Venmo, like you, you need your authentication. It'll probably link it to an account. And then hopefully like people, like what type of accounts are there? And then again, we're sending and receiving you know, we're sending and receiving money. So again, like if I were to summarize it, like if all these technical terms and what I understood is just, we have an app and then we're looking into, okay, where are now the holes into this, right? So we're gonna now place the hat Joshua on like, okay, like Joshua's now gonna go into what will, what's it called? What are we gonna do? Like uh, as far as the modeling. security standpoint, right? Yeah. Uh, threat modeling sorry like as far as the security standpoint like what are we like looking into so um jakey also has a question here who creates the cloud design diagram what role who do you need to collaborate when designing i think that's actually a really great question mm -hmm. um i do also i may need to uh move my friend here uh to another room uh, <laughs> i'll answer that question and then i'll go move him real quick uh but just to answer that question I um traditionally uh ideally the team creating the application creates this uh, so, you know, the developers, uh, the product manager, someone on the team should go through and create this uh, before, uh, honestly, before building out their application. Um, I have created them for teams before, you know, uh, you do what you have to do uh, when the job requires it. So, you know, that is officially what should be happening. A lot of times I'll be given a uh, security review of a application that has never built a design diagram. Uh, and with the time constraints and the team constraints, uh, I may have to go through uh, and create that for them based on their code, based on what I can find. Um, so if you don't mind me, give me two seconds. I'm going to go move him to another room. Uh, he was happily asleep when I started this, uh, and now he's clearly very interested. It's totally okay. We love our furry <laughs> gonna, friends. His favorite it's, spot is my keyboard, so I need to get rid of him or else he's going to start helping me. <laughs> We're welcoming our co co our co coach that says the mystery. That is so cute. I also have my co host here, but he is calm and he's underneath my desk, and his name is Echo. So you'll probably find him like snooping around like my team too. But we do love our co coach. But yeah, so if again, like if anybody has questions, so just to recap on what Joshua has already explained. Cloud design diagram can be created by your product team, by the developer engineers. It could also be the security team. <laughs> on like how big the team is and how um, also like where they are as far as the development of the application or, or that feature. So I think it just we love here. I click the question. It depends, or the answer. It depends. Yeah. So that's <laughs> going to be my my best way of of putting it. it Depends. <laughs> awesome. Exactly. All right, Joshua. So how are you now looking into this as far as like the security, like on a security standpoint, like what, you know, what are you thinking about when you see this cloud diagram? Yeah. So at this point, I'd start to ask, I'm going to kind of play both sides here. So you're going to kind of hear me ask a question. Uh, yeah, I, I think I shared the diagram link a little while ago. Um, I don't know if they can see the the previous chat, but if you scroll up, there is a link to the diagram if you want to interact with it. Um, but you know, we'll I'll, also I'll share this on Slack. Yeah, we'll share this on Slack, and also the link to this is actually on your LMS or the clip platform. If you click like cloud diagram, it should be highlighted in blue, and I'll share you um, the access to this document is there, so it's like a a, a photo reference as well. Okay. Cool. So, you know, I'll, I'll traditionally go in through and start asking questions. So, like, the first thing that stands out to me is this S3 bucket that's being stored outside of the private subnet. Um, 
we don't know what controls are on it. We don't know uh, anything, but that's to me is a big red flag because if that is sitting outside of subnet, that means hypothetically anyone could reach out to it, um, which is going to make me want to add my first little bulb. So I use these little threat actor uh, characters. I'll just usually start with one in the corner and then just cop. See how I have to do this. I'm, I used to use a different application. Let's see if I can just do that. Oh, there we go. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and just draw my first one here, and you'll see what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say uh, an external threat actor could access private resources from public profiles. Um, and obviously, this data in this case is meant to be public. You know, that's kind of the argument you might get back as a, a pushback from a developer. Um, is that you know this is a public S3 bucket because this is public data, um, and that's true. But they should only be able to access this public data from a internal route. So you know I shouldn't be able to go and type in blah 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 in my web browser and uh, pull up the SQL database of your all the user profiles that exist on your company, which is conceptually what you might be able to do if this isn't restricted. Um, you want to make sure that this is restricted, that you can only access it through this connection. Um, so you know the only way I can see a public profile is by clicking on a public profile link and registering it through that direct way. Um, and I have I'm trying to remember the wording I had used earlier because this is one of the ones I wrote up before. Where is it? I have a question, Joshua. Yes. It might be a stupid question, but there's no stupid question. That's why I'm asking it. What's a threat actor? Yeah, so a threat actor is anyone that wants to cause harm to your business, either, you know, conceptually, in this case, I'm talking about an external threat actor. That's someone who wants to cause harm to your business. Uh, you'll also see me use the term uh, unintentional internal threat actor, um, which, you know, is someone accidentally doing something. Uh, you know, the in, the classic intern coming in and deleting the code base is an internal threat actor, oh. an, un, an unintentional mm -hmm. internal threat actor. Uh, they had no intention of causing harm to the business, but they did. Um, you know, oh. that should Thank you for be, answering that but, question. But just to clarify, that that's included in these because, you know, you'll see a lot of these times. I can't remember what application it was. There was some application I, I had that recently, I want to say like a year ago, randomly got a test ping notification on. It was like Twitter or something like that, or Facebook. And I just got a notification that said test one or something like that. Uh, and it was all over the news. Uh, and it, there were some people joking, oh, that intern should be fired. And it did end up actually being an intern. But the fact is they should not be able to do that. Like this, these kind of controls are what's supposed to help prevent that kind of thing. Like they, if you're a less privileged user, you know, the intern on one little team shouldn't be able to send out a notification. They shouldn't have that capability. To do that uh and that's kind of what we're going for and what we're going to get to that in a second when we get to internal threat actors but you know an external threat actor you can just think about as someone who wants to cause harm to the business in some way um awesome. so from here we've created the threat uh we're going to create a recommendation to go with it yeah principal least privilege exactly that's exactly what i'm getting at so let me make sure this is still part of the same thing recommendation we're going to ensure bucket policy access policy is set to private so it's a simple thing again these aren't conceptually uh it, i see one question asking what vpc means um a virtual private cloud uh is just you know a grouping of resources it's kind of the barrier between the internet and your, like no one can access our data VPC. I'm not going to go after this account database and say, um, you know, th th no one's going to hit this. That's not a concern for this because it's not connected to the internet. Uh, no one can access this account database. Only the SendCache service can access the account database. Uh, but you wouldn't want this completely private because you want users to be able to access profiles. Um, and you want that service to be able to, in this case, pull that profile down without needing to, to be an internal tool only. Um, 
you know, it's, it's again, these are simple recommendations. The, the, these are, some of these might even come across as like, well, duh. Uh, but, you know, the fact is it's not. These are not automatic things. If you create an S3 bucket, it is automatically open to public and private. Uh, you have to go in and add that manual change for it to be that way, um, which is why we throw those in here. So if you guys want to start thinking about, if there's one you guys can think of, I'm going to go through one more. Um, and then I'd happy to take any uh, ideas you guys might have. Go from any angle you want, uh, and I'm if not, we'll we'll keep going through ones that I have prepared for this. Uh, but very excited to see if anyone has any uh, ideas I have not thought of on this one already. So the next one that I'm seeing is, like I just said, I'm going to give an example of a an a internal accidental threat actor. Let's see if we can use a different. Uh, logo. I was just using that threat actor, but I like to do the security search on here and just steal a little logo. Let's see. Let's use this. Kind of looks, and it's supposed to mean something else from Azure, but let's go ahead and say internal to increase the, the font and set the color to red. Uh, and we're going to call him internal non- Official term for it. I have it written down. What is it? Is it internal non malicious? Non -malicious a non malicious employee. Oh. Guys, I am learning so much on CyberSec. Non malicious. Um, you could use whatever. Thanks, Honestly, like none of these are like <laughs> terms. You could use whatever. Uh, I'm just trying to stick to what I what what I usually use. Um, but I mean that this stuff is not like industry standard uh, of like what these term necessarily are. Um, mm -hmm. So a non-malicious employee, uh, in this case, you know, I'm looking right at where I pointed out before, uh, that non-privileged internal user. Uh, there's a couple things I see. Yeah, there's also malicious internal employees, you know, someone getting retribution, someone, but I'm going to go with, let's, let's, oh, I always try to be nice. Um, and because these are, you know, a malicious internal employee is the fact is pretty rare. Um, usually these people are pretty vetted. If they do something wrong, it's very easy to trace who it was and they're probably going to face legal charges, uh, very quickly, very mm -hmm. easy. So I, I would say that's, you know, it is something we point out if it's very concerning. Uh, but I try to go with the angle of like, here's what someone could do by accident. Um, it, cause that's a lot more realistic and happens all the time. Uh, so in this case, I'm going to say a the, a non-malicious employee could cause damage to Git repo data CI CD processes or containers um, because in this case we're giving the same level of access to all employees uh, that could mm. hypothetically need it. Um, you know I'm not including mm. like you know you know, front store ops or anything like that. This is like, you know, your CEOs, your your uh, C-suite that's not including technical people, your finance people. Um, they're what's kind of falling into this group. Uh, so I'm going to draw in here something just to them um, with a recommendation. How do I switch that back? There we go. Recommendation. Uh, ensure principle of least privilege. Users should not have more access than required for job. Uh, and this mm -hmm. is you know, making sure that there are roles. So ideally, what I'd want to see a developer take out of this is, you know, maybe instead of just non-privileged internal user, they have a new, I'm going to expand this a little bit, have a little bit more space. I'd like to see them create something like, oh, not that. Uh, let's say finance officer, which only has access to, what's it called? This is the wrong symbol I'm gonna use here for it, but I'm just gonna say AWS cost analysis. And they should only have access to that service. You know, when they log so you in can also, oh, sorry, Joshua. So you can also make other than like adding into into where the holes are. You can also make recommendations yeah. on like what this cloud 
like what the security cloud or like what the cloud diagram should also look like once they implement those suggestions. Yeah. I'm just going to change these right? to blue so it's clear what, you know, to the developer, what you, I added. Ah, I see, I see. Um, but, you I know, see. separating out what I'd want to see. I don't want to just see non-privileged users and privileged users having the same level of access because they shouldn't. Each type of access should be restricted to what they should have the job, uh, what their job requires them to do. So, you know, if you're just given an AWS logon, you probably want to have it. And in AWS and all cloud services allow you to do this, um, and they heavily encourage you to do this. Uh, but, you know, literally go through the list of, does this user have access to this tool? Does this user have access to do anything with this tool? Um, and usually the answer is, for most of it, view only. Uh, for databases, nothing, unless they are working on that database. Uh, and for editing, only what's absolutely required for their job. So if you're on the team managing application X, you know, if you're on the team managing this, uh, the crypto service, you should not have access to the account creation service. Uh, you might be able to view it. I, I usually, that's a big uh, move forward. There used to be the opinion that that should be completely separated. Um, principal least privilege is actually changing a bit to where it's now encouraged to, you know, share code, share resources for learning purposes. Um, I know when uh, we had just moved right before I joined, uh, my first role is when that company had uh, just transitioned from, you know, you could only see your code base to seeing the whole company's code base. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's not really the case anymore. Viewing is kind of standard now of everyone should be able to view everything uh, in case they want to learn and, re and, you know, stop creating redundancies. So your application doesn't do this while the other one does it in a completely different way. But, you know, they still shouldn't be able to edit that, uh, at least without any kind of uh, barriers in the way. So uh, mm. I'm curious, does anyone have any suggestions uh, of anything else to go after? Uh, happy to take input and see if we can think of any more that I haven't thought of. Yeah, so you can drop that into the mirror board, or you can also just go ahead and drop your ideas into the chat on the, what else to be considered. I know we're all new to like cloud threat modeling. Yeah, so don't totally don't be afraid. Okay. Honestly, um, the, the thing I was told when I first did one of these, I was very nervous. Uh, you know, I got thrown into this. I didn't study this in college. I, I mean, I studied computer science, but I didn't study any threat modeling in college. I'd never done one. I'd never done a design diagram. I got thrown in on my first. Uh, like two weeks, here's a design diagram, create a threat model. And here's a previous, uh, like two or three previous ones. Uh, and, you know, I kind of sat there sitting, looking at it for like a week or two, not knowing what to put on it. Um, and then the answer I got was, you know, I ended up just sitting down with someone that was more senior and, and he walked me through it. It was like, just give me anything you can think of. It doesn't matter how stupid mm -hmm. it is. It is a good recommendation. Um, you're not going to put it, you know, you, as you do it more, you're going to learn okay, our developers at our company are always doing this. So I don't need to put like, you know, this, this S3 bucket one. If I know that this team has never badly secured an S3 bucket, I probably don't need to put it in the recommendation. I can save that for when we're, you know, maybe looking at what they've already built and just verifying or running some kind of automated check. Uh, I don't need to put that in the recommendation because they know not to do that. Um, Cause we've called them out on it before and they've learned. Uh, but if, and if you know, they always do this, Make sure you always throw that in, even if it's redundant. Uh, and you kind of learn that as you go. But in the beginning, it, it just go in with whatever you can think of. Does not matter. Absolutely mm -hmm. anything that could be a target is a target. Uh, question. So Nia says here, um, is there a possible threat in data VPC's private subnet while using a said cache for service? Um, I actually think I created one for that. I'm just going to check my notes real quick. Cause I actually think I have one for that. That's good. That's good. Uh... That's awesome. Great job, Nina. Yeah. So I had created something similar to that. Uh, I'm just going to go with these one at a time. Um, and I, I mm -hmm. if you want to give more detail about where you're coming from it, please do. Uh, but the, 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 the issue I had was seeing that this public profile existed and this account database uh, process existed, uh, how this send cache service actually interacted with this uh, public database. Because you know, if I'm sending a cache request to whatever account, 
how is that linking into the actual account database? Is it is what is the the sim link between these two databases? Um, and my answer mm -hmm. here would just be ensuring that there is a backend common link that's not just the username. Um, usually, you'll have some kind of account ID or something like that that's private. Uh, that you know you'll never see it as a user, but there is an account ID associated with your account uh, that mm -hmm. links these two databases. Um, I'm trying to remember the wording I had for that one. I'm going to go ahead and take this as a external one. Well, how about this one? So while you're working on that, Joshua, yeah. um, I think, um, Medara has a, also a suggestion, like how about compliance at that point where the account creation service dumps information into the S3 bucket? Isn't there a case where private information might seep? through to the public, like you said. Yeah, I, I had not thought about that one. That's really good. Uh, let's go through that one Yay. in a second. I want to finish writing this one up because I want to make sure these are all written up into this. Uh, but that one's really good. I'm going to put that one in here. I had not even thought about that. Uh, <laughs> let's see. So for this SendCAF service, we're going to have a uh, an external threat actor could abuse the link between S3 between public S3 and account database. And recommendation here is just, uh, and conceptually, you know, I'm not going to, you know, we're coming at this from a non technical angle. Um, the technical angle of this is you could, uh, in, you know, what's it called? When in the API request that might that's likely being sent between these services, uh, in uh, what's it called? Uh, try what the term is for uh, pretending you're someone that you're not supposed to be. It's a very simple term. <laughs> impersonating. That's the word. Foster. Yes, impersonating. Yes. Uh, they could impersonate uh, someone if there's no good link between these databases. Uh, you know, you could interpret. Mm. In, uh, impersonate someone's username. Um, the ways I'm thinking about that is, you know, you might have, well, like, let, let's say I have uh, my username is at Joshua. I'll put that in the chat. Um, but I might be using a, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of a different, uh, one of those different TypeScript uh, characters. I might create a user that is, uh, in some ways, at least interpreted by the, the system, uh, that user, but maybe the user, the system doesn't recognize spaces. And I'm able to create an account that is, uh, find a way to abuse the account creation system and make something that is that. But when it actually sends the request, it might get shortened into Joshua mm -hmm. and then allow the request mm -hmm. to go through if that's the only link that determines the account. Um, I've seen this done in other applications when I've played with stuff. Uh, you can simulate, especially if it ignores it in, in any step, if it's stripping that down, uh, the extra character that you added, then it could interpret that as a username. So it's just good mm. practice to have, uh, but it, you don't need to understand all that to even just create this recommendation. Just knowing that, you know, it's best practice to have a non-username based, uh, what's it called? Link between the databases is good to have. Mm. Awesome. So we do have a couple of ideas here, Joshua, and we do have five minutes left into our experience. So you can just probably point it out on where that might be on here, because I think that the idea, like uh, on the chat, we have like some other great ideas too, um, like other great suggestions. Sorry, I have not been keeping things. track of the time too much. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're yeah, having I'll, so much fun. Okay, so we have like five one, minutes so, left. You know, I, <laughs> my first one I've done. So, uh, not it's used to all good. We want to thank you for your time. Um, I'm just gonna uh, walk right, so... really quickly. Mm -hmm. Uh so sure. let me go back up. Where is the first one? So yeah, I think this? so. I think you can come after Nita on the chat. Um yep. uh, Madara. We also have Amy and Sadiq. I also yeah. have like some so great This is more of a moderation too. issue, I would say. Uh but you know, ensuring someone doesn't have the ability to accidentally put uh, 
public information. So like my my interpretation of the way you wrote it, uh, and this might not be the way you intended, but uh, my interpretation is just that like, you know, is there moderation to prevent me from putting my social security number uh, as the phone number, mm -hmm. misunderstanding where that's supposed to go? Is there, uh, mm -hmm. you know, conceptually, you wouldn't have that in the public profile in any way in that bucket, you'd have it in the account database. Um, but could a user mistake cause public information to be leaked in a way that they did not intend uh, that could cause serious issues? So, you know, just basic controls to prevent someone from, you know, putting a number as their username um, or stuff like that uh, to prevent someone from leaking their own information publicly that they did not intend. You know, if this is, in this case, you maybe you would want to have first and last names, but if you're not, you know, a kid's gaming network, you probably don't want to allow something that looks like a first and last name to be a username, um, especially if you can't change your username later on, which, you know, PSN or Xbox doesn't really allow you to do that. Um, <laughs> so, you know, you want to have those protections in place to prevent people from doing that and accidentally exposing themselves. Uh, let's see, redundancy of overall architecture. Uh, Amy, I might need you to clarify what you mean by the question. Uh, hold on. I'll come back to you. I might need you to clarify because I'm a little confused on what you mean by it. Mm. Uh, privileged user exploiting elevated access. Absolutely. Um, that is a concern. Uh, that would be... I, I didn't throw that one in here originally. It's something I thought of, but it's it's not one I wanted to throw in right away. Um, so, you know, like I mentioned, the reason you don't have a lot of times uh, internal actors causing major damage intentionally is because you can trace them. Obviously, you need to have uh, the ability to trace them, uh, and that's what that's what, what uh, that would be recommending the information of. I don't remember what the service is called the AWS off the top of my head. Um, there is a service that you can set up that tracks every action of every user um, on mm -hmm. AWS and what they've done. So when you go back through and see, oh, who deleted all of our code? You can see, oh, mm -hmm. this person deleted all of our code at this time from this location. So, uh, you know, obviously it doesn't help too much if that person's been exploited themselves, but you know, uh, that's mm -hmm. a whole other side of the business. Um, but at, at the very least, making sure that you have the ability to track that and prevent something that looks abnormal, like someone at 2 a.m. connecting from Russia who's based in New York without anyone knowing that they traveled to Russia is probably not them in, at 2 a.m. in Russia. Mm -hmm. So having the ability to stop stuff like that. Um, I'm just going to read through a couple of these that I can quickly answer. Um, Nazia, that's good, but I don't know if I have time to walk through that one as much. Uh, I'm just going to skip through and pick out ones that look like they are easy to answer. Uh, so um, Amy did a clarification. Yeah, so I did not include, Amy, I did not include IAM in this diagram. Uh, this mm -hmm. is that's a very light one. Uh, I would, that would go right in here, um, on the diagram, you know, where AWS IAM is, uh, honestly, I would, I, I think I had something to point that out, but you know, that, that would be needed. So that's, that's my bad when I was creating the, if anything, I, I kind of missed on that. I should have added that. <laughs> All good. So we are running out of time. It's already 7 PM. I think what's going to happen and. But I love to continue the conversation. Is drop all of your ideas or Amy, that's a very good recommendation. Yes, that is absolutely really. necessary. Uh, yes, yeah. redundancy between locations is absolutely an availability issue. Um, you want to make sure that awesome. you have different regional, a, a regional backup of some kind. So. Awesome. Awesome. Well, again, continue the conversation. I, I, I love this. Like continue the conversation into our cloud threat, like Slack channel and drop your recommendations there. Joshua is uh, like our coach. Joshua is on Slack, so he can be able yeah, to like, again, give, give some, some more people. feedback. Yeah. Uh, awesome. So give some feedback there. And then speaking of feedback, how we get our feedback from all of our learning opportunities here or and experiences here, I click is we don't have a type form feedback anymore we've upgraded you just go on to click.com i'll go ahead and i'll share this screen i'll share my screen so when you go and open your click.com and when you go into the content so you'll be here and you go into content 
So cloud threat modeling, go into your content, again, log in. All you have to do is you go into feedback and then you're gonna click that blue button to complete the experience. Every link is unique to your account, which is why I have to like make sure that you guys are going through this. Um, but yeah, that's how you fill out your surveys. If you are interested on learning more about cloud threat modeling, if you are interested, in, were you guys able to see that? I just wanna, wanna say that. If you guys are interested in cloud threat modeling, I see here Jiggy's like, is there a sprint for this? Yes, there will be an upcoming sprint for this one um, that will be soon. So we're just gonna confirm some of the dates, but there will be a sprint for this and we are working very, very, very hard on what's yes. our next steps. But again, fill out that um, fill out that feedback. Um, what's it called? Fill out that feedback form. That's how I know that you guys are loving these types of experiences or any topic, anything like that. Please go ahead and fill out that feedback form. Again, complete the experience. That's how I know and how I get feedback from you all. Other than obviously the amazing DMs uh, that you guys shared me on Slack. That's really how we do it. And I'm gonna go ahead and I wanna say thank you everybody for participating in this event. I wanna thank Co Coach Joshua for his first time. Please do give him a round of the applause. This is his first time conducting a shadow session. I know this is like, it gets, we get all jittery, right? If it's like our first time with our shadow sessions and performing, I hope that this has given you guys more insight into cloud security, cloud threat modeling, and again, looking for more and more beautiful experiences to come. Uh, we do have, what else? We do have our resume workshops. We still have upcoming there. We also have a how to scan IPs and how to OSINT that's coming up this week. And more experiences to come. Check out the announcements on Slack. If you guys do have any questions or any um, access troubles on Slack, please go ahead and go and email support at click.com if you guys are having trouble accessing your Slack. That's really the best way to go. But thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lakshmi. Thank you, Shijata, for an amazing session. Thank you, Nita, for coming in and tuning in. I love thank everybody who participated. I love the participation from you guys. Thank you guys for helping Yay. out. Uh, again, this is Yay. supposed to be very, this, this process itself is always collaborative. I've never sat there and kind of just done one on my own. Um, so I appreciate the collaborative effort. Uh, and you know, I, I think she mentioned there is going to be at some point a, uh, to call mini sprint, I think. Yes. Uh, yeah, so, be. you know, that'll be even more collaborative and kind of walking through and, and getting your heavy input on where these, uh, <laughs> these threats would be. Amazing. If you want to learn more again about cloud threat modeling, please go ahead and fill out that feedback form when you complete the experiences. We will see you all next time on your next one. Thank you, everybody, again, for participating. Have a good week. And thank you so much, Joshua. Great time, first time. <laughs> and hopefully we will see you all again very, very soon. Thanks, everyone. Happy learning. And let's thank keep growing all. and launching your careers. Bye, everyone. <laughs>